in, in, in a world that's in the world that we live in, the performance world that's driven by numbers, how do you get the guys and the gals to understand that qualitative aspect of sprinting without taking away from, you know, the, the importance of the, the numbers, obviously, but like you said, it's a kind of a two pronged approach and you need both. You can't just focus on the one. So how do you make that transition? I guess that might come back to the culture point previously a little bit as well. And then the second follow up would be, how do you get, <clears throat> sorry, how do you get your athletes to be in touch with how they're feeling without making it too kind of brainy, if I can put it that way, without getting them to think too much, because we know that when we want them to, to move well and move fast, it has to be, there has to be that instinctive almost uh, aspect to it where you don't want to just think about everything that you're doing too much. So how do you kind of reconcile those, those sides? Yeah, I'm glad you brought both of those up because for one, uh, when it comes to collecting data, we certainly are doing that, right? It's, uh, I would never be one to say that we don't take numbers. And, but the thing about when I, when I, when I just see numbers on a page to me, that's quantitative analysis. Like mm -hmm. that's just, that's giving me some part of the picture, but not the whole picture. So, uh, I need to understand some kind of calls qualitative assessment of what, what these numbers are portraying. You know, you get, a say you have an athlete jump on a force plate and you get the numbers. You know, oh, this guy has a 20% imbalance. You know, he's using his right leg 20% more than his left. Okay, great. But what does that really tell me other than just, just simply that <laughs> like there's an imbalance. But if I were to take a video analysis of slow motion and then compare it to that, I now have both. I have a qualitative assessment and I have the number to show, Oh, well, look at what's happening with his right knee or his left knee, you know, whatever. He's, he's completely leaning left. He's pushing off things like that. Then you can show the athlete that video too. Hey, look at what you're doing. Are you aware that you're doing that? Like, Oh no, I had no idea I was doing that. Okay. Yeah. Well now that like, it, look at what it's doing to the number that's showing up here. Right. And so uh, the same thing with sprinting is, you know, the 1080 sprint, obviously this incredible machine gives you an incredible amount of data and there's so many different data points that you can look at. But even with that, we have to film the sprint mm -hmm. because if it's showing a certain trend, sometimes we can just immediately, we can look at this athlete sprint at the same time and say that that is perfectly portraying what we're seeing on here. You know, this guy's a very heavy, uh, he, he's, he's so force dominant. Well, look, he's like really overreaching and trying to stay on the ground longer because he doesn't have great elastic ability and it's showing up in this video, right? And then you can show the athlete that in conjunction with showing the athlete video of some of the best sprinters in the world. Hey, look, look at what they're doing in terms of some of these principles that we're talking about, right? This, you know, some of the things we talk about as they're approaching higher speeds would be like, you know, you want to bounce off the ground. You don't want to just like stomp your feet. It's not about like trying to actively aggressively, like just punch the ground as hard as you can. It's about putting effective force on the ground. So it's going to be high, obviously if you were to measure it, but it's about being smooth with it, being bouncy, being springy as you're approaching these higher speeds and you're entering more of an elastic environment. So uh, we show them what a high level sprint looks like in that transition point. And then we show them what they look like. You know, and we compare the two and I, and I, I'll make, you know, kinograms of all of our guys and I bring them in to our office and I show them, I say, this is, this is Christian Coleman, the, the 60 meter world record holder, the best accelerator on the planet in terms of short distance. Look at his first three steps. Look at your first three steps. You know, look at the trends of what we're seeing with him versus what we're seeing with you. And what we see with a lot of our guys are things like they get too big and they stay too big, you know, in terms of like their thigh separation, they're over striding, they're casting out with the foot. Uh, whereas Christian Coleman or any other high level sprinter will expand really big in the push and then they'll contract quickly into the next step. So their, their thighs separate really big and then they come together quickly up, uh, upon touching the ground into the next step. Hmm. So we have other guys that do the opposite. They stay little all the time. They never expand. Right. And so you start to see how the data that's coming out, of the machine or the times that we're measuring are coinciding with what we're seeing visually and qualitatively as well. So to me, that's where they get more buy-in from that because most athletes in team sport are used to looking at film, used to looking at video. You know, that's how they've learned because that's how coaches coach them is, you know, look at where your position is here. You should be more doing this. This would be more effective. So we do the same thing. We just attack their brain from the same standpoint to help them try to comprehend what we're trying to talk about. So we have basically film study for strength and conditioning, you know, or sports performance. 
And it works really well because a lot of times they just hadn't they, – they've never seen themselves run, you know, except for in the football context. But they've never just seen themselves work out. And it's yeah. very interesting for them to see themselves. And um, the next point – the next question was touching on – you remind me again what the next, next part was t- talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Your so when you're asking them for that feedback of how they're feeling on the moment – uh, like you say, the psychology, the emotional side, everything is is tied into how they're going to feel on the on the day, and whether or not they're maybe you know fit to to run what you plan, or if you have to pull them back. So, how do you get them to stay aware of the, all those factors and how they feel mm. without making them think too much while they're sprinting? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yep. So, really, the biggest thing I a lot of times I try to give them really one to two, possibly three things to think about on any given day, like they could do a sprint. I could be like, man, there were like 15 things wrong with that. <laughs> you know, like immediately seeing it, especially going back and like get the slow, slow motion video and, and all that. But to me, it's just, how can I focus on the most important thing right now? And sometimes I'm sure I'm incorrect on what the most important thing might be, but at least it's something that I see as a coach first. Let's address just that. Cause I know that's an issue. Let, let's work on that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm really big on not over coaching because I've, in my private sector experience, I know that when I would hand hold these athletes through their preparation, they would never be able to do it if I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And I learned that lesson the hard way with, uh, I had one guy I was preparing for his NFL pro day. And it was when I was a younger coach and I was, I was hand holding him through everything. Like when you get set up in your 40 yard stance, do this, do that, do this, lift your hips to here. Okay. You know, just after every rep, okay, that was good. But X, Y, Z, you know, just constantly giving him things to work on and, and which worked, uh, you know, you look at some of the motor control research in terms of what translates to performance. And a lot of times it's like, you can have a great practice coaching that way because you've, you've gotten them to do everything. You've micromanaged the entire thing. Mm-hmm. So you can have an awesome practice that way. So you'll see higher increases in, in practice performance earlier on, but then when they go to perform, they lose it because you're not there to hand hold them or hold their hand through the entire process. That's what happened with this guy is he went to go do his pro day. I couldn't go to the pro day and it was a disaster. You know, he just, he was in his own head. He was self-conscious. He had no idea what was going on. He was just like waiting for me to give him some instruction and I wasn't there. And so, you know, the other, the other thing in some of the uh, motor learning research is that if you, try to facilitate the learning more in terms of get asking them questions almost well how'd that feel to you you know what do you what do you think about what you just did then they start taking ownership of their own performance and then they're they're being given the permission to perform in a way that is unique to them but still sort of abiding by these these general boundaries which are basically general principles of biomechanics that are being facilitated from the from the coach or the director or whatever it might be and the motor learning research shows that you'll see a slower improvement in performance and practice that way, but more likely you will see an improved performance in the context of what's needed, like the game performance or the competitive performance will actually improve. And so for me, it's, I try to find that balance between the two of obviously part of my job is to be a coach here. And there's something about, you know, a coach's presence that, Team sport players are constantly trying to ask their coach, was that good? What would I do wrong? What can I fix? You know, or they're just expecting the coach to say it, whether or not they ask. So I've had multiple athletes say like, how was that? And I'll just be like, yeah, it was good. And like, that's about all I give them. You know, like do another rep. Let's see how it goes. You know? And then like after I might not even say much. And then afterwards it's like, so how'd that feel for you? What did you feel that might've been different from yesterday when we did this, you know? And that's something I, that I've seen, Stu at Altus coaches that way. And uh, I've seen a lot of coaches start to do that in some of these other disciplines. And um, I've seen great success that way, but I think that you need to be proficient at both. Sometimes you need to come in and say like, Hey, Hey, listen, like <laughs> what you're doing is a complete wreck. Like don't, don't do that. You know, that's, that's not good at all. And I usually do that when it's dangerous or just mm-hmm. clearly an aberration of biomechanics. You know, at that point I immediately step in and I say, Hey, listen, like that was, that's an unsafe position. Let's get you in a safer position, you know, but then once I know it's somewhat safe, I let them try to explore it a little bit. And that, that, that's my style. It's not everybody's style that's, that's around here, but, um, or just around the field in general, but that, that's something that I've, I've, uh, seen good success trying to work both sides of the fence, but more often than not, if I can, 
uh, lean towards allowing them to explore it for themselves, then that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm.